which is um, a mix of the the middle one and then the matrix one, I guess, would be the best way to put it. So let us say there we split the hu human population in half, and half of them get to go in a consensually uh, the experienced machines where they are generally happy, most of their needs are provided for, but they're not just being fed dopamine kind of deal. But the other half of humanity has to farm um, and do all the things necessary to keep those people alive while they're in the boxes. Oh, so capitalism. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, an allegory for capitalism. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think... How do you tackle this? I... <laughs> I'm going to have a hard time theoretically tackling this because it's going to depend so much on specifics. Um, it's going to depend upon the quality of living of the people who are, you know, working to feed the machine. Um, it's going to depend upon the quality of the living of the people who live in the machine. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the sort of thought experiment we're sort of getting at here is very close to the, uh, um, have you ever heard of the ones who walked away from Amalas? I've not heard of that Saul experiment, no. Um, I think it's Le Guin. Um, it's a fantasy short story that was meant as a critique of utilitarianism. Um, and the idea is that oh, you, have, is. Yep, you have a small community that lives an idyllic existence where everything is great, except for one person who, by lottery, is put in a closet and is occasionally like poked with brooms and lives just a miserable, wretched existence. And the idea is, if you have a society that is good, but is powered by the suffering of a minority, is that still a moral society? Um, and I personally turn to Rawls for an answer to that. I haven't is, listened about Rawls yet, or read about Rawls quite yet, other than the very, very general stuff about his government. Yeah. Or his politics. So Rawls is... Um, interesting because i think he provided political philosophers with a really useful lens for looking at what's good and what's not good um the veil of ignorance is this concept that if you are going a society should be judged based upon whether a person would want to live in that society if they were assigned a random role so if I were going into a society where I had a one in 1,000 chance of being miserable and a one in a 999 out of 1,000 chance of living a fulfilled, happy, great existence, you know, I'd probably take that risk. And so that's the answer to Amalas there. But the flip side is if you have a society where you have a fairly large sustained underclass, but you have a couple miserable, a couple, not miserable, a couple very happy people. So if you have 500 people who are working day and night to support this uh, idyllic existence of, you know, 20 people at the top, I don't want to be in that society. And I think Rawls's analysis is how I'd be looking at your fourth top, uh, thought experiment is if I have a coin flip between happy and unhappy. I'm not sure I want to take that coin flip. I mean, yeah, yeah I wouldn't either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, and, I, and I think that it's a very fair way to look at a society where, you know, you can't look at average happiness. You're almost more looking at median happiness, right? Um, and so when I'm looking at the society you've created, a lot of it's going to depend upon how good things are on the outside of the machine and how good things are on the inside of the machine. If things suck on the outside of the machine, I don't want any part of that. Yeah. Uh, so the best critique of utilitarianism that I personally can offer, I guess, uh, beyond the moral intuitionism um, or intuitivism, I, I forget what I called it, um, or if there is a proper name that I haven't found yet. Um, but I guess it would be the... I would call it an either or critique sure. and that utilitarianism kind of limits the options you have in doing the action and then not doing the action um, or maybe like a couple others. Uh, but I think the, the range of our choices, especially as a society over years is going to be 
almost boundless. Like there's, there's just so many different places that we could take it in that thinking that doing an action versus not doing the action is enough moral consideration to take is I think kind of reductive in a sense. Cause it, the, what is it? Uh, the thought experiment you had where one guy just gets poked. Why does that one guy have to get poked for the other people's happiness? I guess. Why can't you just restructure ha uh, a society where every single member of the society gets to be happy without anybody getting poked in the closet? Uh, well, part of that is me. Um, okay. So I have two responses. The first one is, um, part of what you're running into is uh, critiques of utilitarianism are actually the reductive ones. Um, so that's why you have these sort of complicated thought experiments with multiple like you know axioms that we have to accept for this is how we're doing it and this is what this means, um, boiling it down to a yes or no decision. Um, utilitarianism, is, there is a yes or no component to it. But the way I view it is it's yes or no in the same way that um, computer coding, you have binary. You, you have small decisions that are yes or no. But policy making and political philosophy and everything in that vein is significantly more complicated. And you're completely right there that, you know, we, we can't be making it based upon individual, you know, individual minute, like atomic decisions. But uh, you you build it together. You have things like rural utilitarianism as a concept, where you have these things like whether or not following um, a rule regarding theft or, or assault is a good idea. And that is far from something that's atomic, because if we're talking atomically, like, you know, you're a single person making a single decision, um, if there is someone you know is an inherently a bad person and someone you know is inherently going to be a harm to your friends and family. In that situation, utilitarian analysis says, you know, have Adam, beat him up, right? But that that doesn't make sense as a way to structure a society. And so I think that utilitarianism and part of the reason why it's easy for people to reduce it down in kind of a way that doesn't really work, it, 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 it all has to build up. You have to say, well, yes, you can beat up this person who is a threat to your family, but at the end of the day, if we have vigilantism, what is that going to do as like a snowball effect? What is that, what, what, how, how is that going to impact everyone else? And what it comes down to is that, um, and this is, I think, actually almost a better critique of utilitarianism, is that you have this knowledge problem where anytime you have a consequentialist philosophy, you have to have some idea as to what the end result and what all of the things are going to be at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. it just becomes so complicated where you, you know, you pull one thread and it unravels this over there, tips this out of balance over here. And you can actually be paralyzed by this lack of knowledge because everything is so interconnected. Um, and the more complex your policy gets, the more you start worrying, well, what if I'm not foreseeing something? And I, and I think that's actually, I mean, you, you want to avoid being paralyzed by lack of knowledge, but at the same time, I think that that's actually a very valid critique of utilitarianism, which is that if you're looking at it properly, if you're trying to take into account all of the possible outcomes from a, a course of actions you're taking, um, it's really easy to just lock down because you don't have enough information to actually take action. Yeah. And then on the other end, um, so... I think there's the ontology on the other end of consequentialism. And I was reading the groundwork of metaphysics of morals. Um, and it only took me like three days or so. It's not very long. Um, and that was with the commentary by Patton or H.J. Patton, if you know, if you've read Kant before. Um, read a little bit but, of his metaphysics, didn't bother too much with the morality. Yeah. Uh, the morality is not that good, but it sets it, the way that Kant phrases it, he kind of just sets up a um, system for all of them. Even though he disregards consequentialism, he kind of sets up a way to view it. But he's just like, that's immoral. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, but what I learned from that book and The Good Place, because Chidi in The Good Place, if you've seen that, um, the, he's the philosophy professor. But a lot of the choices he makes even though he is a deontologist, uh, likes Kierkegaard and Kant and so on and so on, he 
he does not make those choices very easily. Um, even though he has, uh, I guess, an internal rule against lying and stuff. Uh, so the way I see it, the anthology is that it doesn't give you m much easier choices than consequentialism, but it gives you a lot more consistent choices than uh, consequentialism. And that's so it doesn't, so it doesn't really 